Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program. I'm Eric Benfeld, uh, Extension Specialist for Community Viability and Community Food Systems with Virginia Cooperative Extension and Virginia Tech. And today's educational program will highlight Virginia agriculture, uh, focus on community nutrition and farm to table connections. And this is a program of Virginia Cooperative Extension, which is an outreach program of uh, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University, the two land grant universities here in the, the Commonwealth. And the uh, Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program is designed to highlight the produce and livestock that's raised on farms across the Commonwealth and also to demonstrate how to create delicious and nutritious food with the highlighted ingredient. A little bit more about Virginia Cooperative Extension. We deliver educational programs through a network of uh, faculty at the two universities, and we also have 108 county and city offices, 11 agriculture research and extension education centers, and six 4-H educational centers. And if you have not participated, I would encourage you to participate in your local Virginia Cooperative Extension programs to learn more. And today's session is specifically focused on grains. Uh, Virginia has traditionally been, uh, has grown grain, and today we're going to learn a little bit more about uh, how it's grown, harvested, milled, and can actually be used in a recipe. And we're fortunate to have Ryan Geringer and Kyle Stevens of Arden Mills with us today, as well as uh, Michael Grants of Great Day Gardens and the Common Grain Alliance. And we also are joined by Janelle Smith and Betty Gartner of Virginia Cooperative Extension. If you would have questions about uh, recipes or nutrition or more questions about grain production. And so I encourage you to, to mute your microphones if you haven't already. And if you have any questions, you can write those questions in the question and answer box or the chat dialog. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues and welcome again to the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program. I think I'll jump in here. Um, this is Michael Grants with uh, Common Grain Alliance and Great Day Garden. So anyways, I'm going to do a quick presentation here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about grain growing in the Mid-Atlantic um, and talk about the Common Grain Alliance, which is an organization I'm a part of. Um, so the Common Grain Alliance is a nonprofit group based in Virginia. We have members throughout the Mid-Atlantic from North Carolina up to Pennsylvania. Um, and our area that we work in is developing the, the value chain from growing grains on the farm all the way through production into baking and consumption at home. Um, so you can see on the screen right now a few of the pro programs that we have going on right now. Um, a lot of what we've been focusing on over our first couple of years in existence has been developing our network um, and encouraging people, millers, to meet more farmers in the local area, connecting baker, bakers and bakeries with um, growers who um, are producing th those crops more locally. Um, and at the end of this slideshow, I'll have a couple links to check out as far as the Grain Alliance goes. So why don't we move to the next slide? Um, so, so now I'm going to talk a little bit just about grain growing in the mid-Atlantic. Um, we're going to talk, most of this applies just to cereal crops, such as oats, wheat, uh, barley, rye, and small grains like that. Um, obviously corn, sorghum, and other crops like that are also grains, but for this program we're going to be focusing on the cereal crops. So, um, we have a number of farmers who are members of the Common Grain Alliance. Most of them are pretty small scale farmers. Um, we have 
members who are organic growers. We have members who um, are mostly conventional growers also. Uh, however, everybody in our group is committed to, to stewarding the land in a healthy way and uh, preserving our soil resources. So our members use a lot of practices like cover cropping that involves growing crops just to feed the soil uh, and the biology that lives in the soil. Um, they're concerned about minimizing their tillage and disturbance to the soil so that it doesn't um, this <clears throat> doesn't burn up all the carbon that's in the soil and uh, mis minimizing inputs, which um, both helps the, po the pocketbook of the farmer and is also great in uh, preserving the ecology. And um, as we go through this, I'm going to try to give you a sense of the timeline over the course of the year. Um, so right about now we're coming up on the small grain planting season here in late September. Uh, from about now until early November is when most of the growers that I know in our area are um, planting their crops. So next slide is a couple pictures of the growing process. Um, over the course of the winter, there's not a whole lot going on on the grain farm. Um, if, if you're not spraying for killing weeds, then you would be cultivating um, to kill some of those weeds that are growing underneath the crop. Um, you can see a picture on the right side is a healthy stand about ready to harvest. Uh, the top left is a picture of a combine going, going through the field. And um, harvest time comes about late June, early July. So if everything's gone well, then around that time, a uh, grain farmer will be harvesting their crop. So we can move to the next slide. So this is, this is a couple pictures of the uh, post-harvesting process. And for, for small scale growers, really this is where a lot of the labor and precision comes in to producing a quality grain product. Um, there's a lot of sifting that has to be done to remove larger or smaller seeds, weed seeds that might be contaminating a wheat crop a wheat crop. And then on, so that's a picture on the, on the left uh, of a grain cleaner. And then on the right is what's called a gravity table, which will sort out your seeds based on density. You'll have light density seeds on one side and heavier, dens heavier density seeds on the other side. And typically seeds with more density are going to be uh, more nutrient dense, but also have a better germination rate if you're sa saving that wheat for seed and generally better quality for milling. So that this is just to show two examples of a lot of different equipment that can be used um, throughout the post-harvest processing stage. And um, a, a, a lot of the challenge of growing grain in our region in the mid-Atlantic involves just the climate that we have here. Farmers obviously in the Midwest have a much easier time because they get less rainfall in the summer months when it's harvest season and moisture can, can wreak havoc, havoc on the quality of the grain and make it a little bit more difficult to use. Uh, but there's still growers growing grain for bread making, everything from that um, to biscuit making. Traditionally, the South is sort of a, more of a soft wheat producer rather than hard wheat for bread. But um, I've met growers throughout the region who are growing all kinds of different varieties. So the, the producers in our network with the Grand Alliance are typically selling direct to cust either a small business or directly to the customer. So we have bakeries, breweries, distilleries uh, who are purchasing amounts of grain. And overall, we, we see this as a way to shorten the value chain and in the end put more money in the farmers pockets. The statistic that I looked up before this presentation is that on average about 13 cents um, of the average loaf of bread goes to the farmer to pay for the wheat that goes into it and we would we would like to see that number grow um, for farmers to be able to employ more people on the land, um, to steward the land, and to earn a living on their farms. And 
So, that, so here's a couple links um, with the Grain Alliance. You can learn more about us on our website. We've just established a YouTube channel that we only have one video on there right now, but we're gonna be posting some new videos here in the coming weeks. And then if, you want, if you're a grower and you wanna learn more about the post-harvest processing system, um, we're hosting a webinar next week on September 29th. And that link is, is right there. You can copy that down um, or look at it in the recording here. So yeah, I think that that's it for the CGA. I, I would like to say that uh, most of our mo most of our growers are on a really small scale and especially the mills um, that, that are involved with our network are very small. So I'm excited to see Ardent Mills, um, who's going to present next. But that, just so you all know, Ardent Mills is at a much larger scale uh, than what most of our producers are dealing with. So yeah, I'll pass it off to Ardent. Thanks, Michael. Um, so Ryan Geringer is here, and we have a video which is kind of like a virtual tour of their plant in Culpeper. Um, but Ryan, do you have anything you want to say before I show that? I uh, no, just wanted to say, you know, so we, we do got myself, Ryan, <clears throat> Kyle Stevens, our head miller here. Um, we do have 34 people working at this facility, so definitely a, um, a, a bigger operation um, than maybe some of the stuff other, others would be familiar with. But, um, yeah, I think pretty much uh, we have a, a, a virtual tour, and that should pretty much uh, show the, the overview of our, our facility here. And any questions at the end of it, we're more than happy to answer. All right. Thank you, Ryan. We're getting ready to view the Culpeper, Virginia flour mill. Uh, it was built as a 12,000 hundredweight per day facility. So that's 1.2 million pounds a day. The facility has definitely grown over the years. Um, on the right side of the photograph there, you see seven bins. Those, are, those were built about four years ago. Um, so a lot of investment has been made here to increase our storage capacity for wheat. And we now can currently store 2.1 million bushels. And that is to help us really take in a lot of the local wheat in this area and store it for use uh, year round. We go one of our operators, he is standing at the truck unload right now, probing the truck. Um, what he does, that probe, you'll see where it goes down into his truck. We do three different probes, one to the front, center, and rear of a vehicle. It works on a vacuum system, pulling the wheat into the lab for the operator. You can see the wheat coming in from that vehicle now. They will start grading it and cleaning it right there to test it, get a protein, moisture, falling number. So then once the operator has uh, all the tests have come back and the wheat is acceptable for us, we will forward the driver into the unload pit. He'll pull through, stop at another kiosk. It'll ask hey, him when he's ready to, to unload. That's about 900 bushels these trucks bring in a day takes him roughly 47 seconds to a minute to drop that truck and just a little pers perspective on that vehicle right there on that truck milling time is about 45 minutes on the mill and that wheat's gone being the wheat's an agricultural commodity and comes out of a wheat field um, it's important to clean it in the cleaning house uh, before we put it on the mill to grind it we got seven pieces of equipment it flows through this is called a combi cleaner it's got four different decks in it. It's separating the stones, the soybeans, any foreign material, broken wheat comes out of the wheat into a trash receptacle. The wheat throughs will go on through to another piece of cleaning equipment on the floor below. Through this cleaning house, we run 1,400 bushel an hour.
This is an aspirator. You'll see on the side of it here where it's actually shooting the wheat through air. And you'll see the chaff and everything that is pulling up out of the millable wheat. That chaff's being pulled up through our uh, filter system. Before we mill the clean wheat, we need to add water to it. So this is a process called tempering. And we add water to it in order to soften up the bran and allow us to slough that off and release the endosperm in the milling process. It is tempered anywhere from 12 to 18 hours before the milling process. And it's all automated from the control office also. The assistant miller when pulling it knows what bin to put into. The head miller or the miller can pull those bins in correlation to the uh, flour that he's milling. So finally, we've got our clean tempered wheat and we're ready to start the milling process. So the first piece of equipment that the, the clean wheat is going to hit are the roll stands. Each roll stand has at least two sets of rolls on each side. And as stock falls in between those rolls, they're rotating in different directions and that causes the endosperm to be peeled off the bran. This is taking a look at a third break stand. That's the stock coming from second break to third break. Here it's going on to the rolls. So here our head miller is just going to show what the stock looked like prior to um, falling through these rolls and then after passing through these rolls. For the roller mills that we lay out and you can see where it's already separating the bran and the flour. Now underneath of the rolls we'll pull some stock and you can see the difference in the two. This will pass through the uh, sifters up on the floor again, come back down through purifiers, back to a fourth break, fifth break. So you can see the difference on the passages as it's slowly separating the bran and the flour and the sperm. From those rolls that you just saw, it's all pneumatically lifted back upstairs. It'll be separated through the sifter boxes themselves. Um, the size of the sifter clothing that we have set up in there will separate the particle sizes as to what roll stain or sifter section it goes to next. So various fractions of the wheat kernel are going to pass through these sifter sections probably several times, moving through the sifters, hitting rolls, and also purifiers on their way to their final destination. Here we go on the uh, third floor, underneath all the sifter sections. Most of the sections have five streams underneath each one. 72 different sections up there. So this is the granulation that's set up through the clothing we have in the boxes as to what goes to what roll stand or sifter section. That is all set and adjusted each year as new crop comes in. Through our purifiers, which is taking the fine stock and separating the uh, smaller pieces of bran almost to our finishing stages through first mids sizings eventually works its way all the way to the end of the mill to our patent rebolt section 50,000 pounds of flour an hour going through that sifter section right there and it's sampled tested every hour before it goes into our storage bins to be loaded and released to the customers. This is the bottom of our flour bins where our bulk loader sets up his runs to pull flour from whatever flour bin, what type of flour he needs for the load that he's pulling at that time. It's at this point that our flour heads onto our final product zone or what we call our FPZ. Um, this is our last opportunity to remove any uh, metal or foreign material from our product before it gets to the customer. So we pass it through an FPZ sifter and it heads on its way to the loadout tanks where our bulk loaders will then drop the load into trailers to ship to our customer. And then quality testing is done at various stages in the process here. Um, the falling number test is being conducted and this um, helps our customers analyze the alpha amylase activity. But before every load is released, 
um, we will complete the falling number and moisture ash and protein um, by a near infrared machine. So these specs um, help us deliver certain types of flour to our different um, customers. This is us testing the wheat, um, testing the moisture and protein prior to sending it to the mill to make sure um, we are grinding the right wheat for the right flour. So once our flour meets customer specs, it's now time for a bulk loader to load the trailer. We're lucky enough to have our bulk carrier right here on site. The loader will then complete all the necessary paperwork that our customers require and that you legally need to ride on the road. And they're down the road and off to our customer. Thank you guys for putting that together. Um, we have all just commented so much about how we didn't know making flour was so complicated. Um, so I will pass it back over to um, Michael um, from Great Day Gardens. He has a blueberry walnut scone recipe for us. Do you wanna say anything about this before I share the video? Um, I guess I didn't mention earlier just what Great Day Gardens is. Um, that's my full-time job. My wife and I live outside of Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, so Great Day Gardens is a wood-fired bakery and market garden. We sell mixed produce and baked goods, mostly sourdough bread, uh, to area farmers markets and direct to consumers. Cool. So now that we've learned how the flour is milled. Let's learn a little bit about how to use it in a delicious recipe. Hi, I'm Michael Grants with Great Day Gardens. We are a wood-fired bakery and market garden located just outside of Lynchburg, Virginia in a town called Forest in Bedford County. We've been growing vegetables and baking here for about six years now. Um, we, ser we serve the Lynchburg area, including the Lynchburg Community Market, Forest Farmers Market, as well as a 30-member CSA program. And then we also sell our vegetables and baked goods through an online ordering platform and do deliveries around the city. I'm going to show you how to make scones using local ingredients, including some local flour. So we have the um, stone milled wheat flour from Grapewood Farm, Grapewood Farms in Montrose, Virginia. Uh, this is sifted soft red wheat flour. It's really great for making biscuits, scones, anything like that. Not as great for making bread. Uh, we have our other ingredients laid out. So you can follow along with the recipe that you have. Uh, and I already have all of our ingredients scaled out. So the first step is we're going to take all of our dry ingredients. We're going to blend them together in the bowl. So start with flour since we have the most of that one. Then we have our baking powder. You want to use baking powder, not baking soda. Powder will give you better leavening. And then we have our sugar and salt. And we're actually going to hold out the blueberries and walnuts until later since they're uh, coarser ingredients. Uh, we want to start with just the really fine stuff right now. So once you have your dry ingredients, you can blend them together. This kind of pastry blender is great, but you can also just use a fork and a rubber spatula or something like that to get them to mix together. The fluffier you get it, the better. So once we have our dry ingredients blended up, then we're going to add our butter. If you want the butter, it doesn't have to be all the way to room temperature. It should be a little bit warmer than the fridge so that it's more malleable. And we're using unsalted butter. So then I'm going to use the pastry blender again and use it to crush up these chunks. And again, you don't have to have the pastry blender for this. You can just use your hand because uh, at this point the, the butter is soft enough. We can blend it by hand. So the next step is just to take it 
and between your fingers and your palm, just sort of slide it back and forth. And that, what you're doing is pressing the butter into the dry ingredients and basically getting all of those dry ingredients coated with the fat of the butter. So this will take a few minutes. And this recipe is scalable. So you, uh, our batch is gonna make eight scones. You could double it, it'll make 16 scones. That'll still probably fit on the sheet pan in the home kitchen. Uh, and then if you double that again, make 32, then you have two sheet pans in the oven at one time. You can still do it as one batch. All right, so let's do a close up on this can. And you can see the butter, you can still see some pieces in it, but it's pretty well blended in. Um, you can see some chunks like that. But basically it's in pea sized pieces or less. And most of them are pretty well coated with butter. All right, so the next step is we're gonna put together our liquid ingredients. So we have our buttermilk here. You can also use milk or yogurt or basically any other kind of dairy product, but I really like the sour flavor that comes with buttermilk. One egg, one egg typically weighs about 50 grams. And then you don't need to whip up the egg, but just break up the yolk a little bit and get it mixed in with the buttermilk. Once you have those two together, then we're just gonna go all in at once and pour all of that liquid into the dry ingredients. And I like to use these little hand scrapers, rubber spatula would do the same thing. So we've got all our dry, dry ingredients, all our liquids. The only thing left is our coarse pieces, which we're gonna add in at the very end. And you can use your hands in there, but stuff gets really sticky. So I like to use something else, a spoon or a rubber spatula or scraper so my hands don't get too dirty. And you don't want to over mix scones because you want the, the crumb and texture of it to be as soft as possible. So the more you mix it, uh, the more you're going to develop the gluten and it's going to harden the scones. So you want to avoid that happening. But we do need to get all these dry pieces covered in liquid mixed in. So, when we're to this point and it's almost come together, you see there's still a few little dry pieces there. It's almost totally mixed in. That's when we're going to add in the coarse pieces. And those again are all at once. So we have chopped blueberries and walnut pieces. All right, so all of our add ins are in. And then we're just going to mix it around a little bit more. And at this point, all we're trying to do is get those coarse pieces blended throughout the mass of dough. All right, and that's it for this step. So the next thing we're gonna do is put it in the fridge, let it chill for uh, at least 15 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and shape the scone. All right, so we've chilled the dough for about, I think it was about 25 minutes or so. And the reason that we do that is that it just firms up the dough a little bit. It's not as runny and sticky when we go to roll it out and shape it. Um, so we're just going to dust the surface a little bit and I just sanitize this with a little bit of um, vinegar solution and we're also going to dust the top of our scone ball. So then we're going to get it into a little bit of a circular shape, pat it on top, the more flour the easier it's going to be and the less it's going to stick to your rolling pin, which can be really frustrating. Uh, but when you add the flour, you do want to spread it around on the surface of the dough so you don't get any big clumps of dry flour in there. Just roll it really gently. The dough is super soft right now, so you don't need much pressure. And to help prevent it stick, I'll just flip it back to the other side. About, I would say about a nine inch circle. I do a little bit shorter than the length of my rolling pin, which I believe is a 10 inch rolling pin. But you can do it however you want. If you like taller, thicker scones, you can leave it in a, a smaller circle. If you like it more, more thinner and a little bit crisper, and you can keep rolling it out a little bit wider. And then the way I like to cut it is in the triangles, pizza style. 
So I go two 90 degree lines. So that gives us four pieces. And then the last cut gives us eight. And again, you can do whatever shape you want. If you don't like triangles, you can draw it out and do it in squares, however you'd like to do it. Then we're going to line it out on our baking sheet. And it is important to do, if you want them to rise properly, you want to have a really clean cut as much as you can. You might have noticed I was trying to just press down and back up rather than dragging the knife across and steering. And then the final step is going to be doing our egg wash. So I have a pinch of sugar and a pinch of salt already in the jar here. And take one egg. What the, the salt does is actually denatures the egg and the sugar gives you a little bit of sweetness um, on the egg wash. It helps you brown up the pastry once while it's baking. This is kind of a quick way to do an egg wash instead of adding the cream. And then when you wash, I prefer not to uh, coat the sides for the same reason that we want to cut really clean on the sides. If the egg wash isn't binding those edges together, uh, then the pastry will be able to rise up a little bit better than if you coat it all with um, egg wash. And these are also great because you can make a big batch and then at this point before you put on the egg wash you can stick them in the freezer and then whenever you have guests coming over or whatever and you want to bake them you can literally take them straight out of the freezer and put them straight in the oven without thawing and bake great like that. So now we're going to put it in the oven. Uh, the oven will be at 425, uh, 425 degrees We'll bake them for about 20 minutes. So here are a few of the different flours that we use. All of these come from farms in North Carolina and Virginia. Uh, we have a roller milled flour, which is an all purpose flour. It's typically what you think of when you think of white flour. We have a whole grain stone mill milled flour, which you can see is a little bit coarser. Uh, it has the entire bran and germ and everything in the grain in it. We have sifted flour that has some of that bran. And then we have the same flour that's just really finely sifted. And this is stone milled, uh, but if you sift out all the really big pieces, then you end up with a really nice fine flour. And then we have two types of rye flour. This is a whole grain rye, and this one's been slightly sifted. All right, um, Brian and Michael, did you have anything else to add before we move on to questions? No, I don't think so. Nope, nope, we're, we're in good shape here. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of, uh, tried to capture as much of the process as we could, uh, but by all means, yeah, any, any questions, happy to answer. <laughs> Ryan, you've, the first question was from Janelle Smith, and she was curious about the, how long the process takes from start to finish for a load of wheat, and also about how flour is enriched. Is, is it enriched at the plant or done at the bakeries? Yeah. Yep. So we do, uh, so from start to finish, our mill here, the milling unit that we have, uh, mills Five, you know, 50,000 pounds of flour in an hour. Um, so basically to fill that tanker up in the video, you know, like a, a bulk tanker that you'd see traveling down the road, uh, that's one hour on the mill and we'll generate that quantity of flour. Um, and then we definitely, we have, we have several different types of enrichments, iron enrichments and, um, you know, bleaching type agents as well. Um, that we're, we're putting into flour um, to affect the, the baking characteristics as well as the nutritional value. So, yeah, we, can, we do that here as we're transferring the flour from our work in progress bins into the, the six loadout bins that we have. Um, we, we add those, all those ingredients here. As a, as a follow-up, Ryan, I was curious specifically about vitamin B. And also, could you explain the bleaching process? Yeah, so the so typically, um, as far as bleaching agents in the flour milling industry, there's two major 
ones that are used. So there's an, an actual additive um, that does make the flour a little bit lighter, but, but also impacts the way that uh, the, the flour actually bakes. Um, and then there's also chlorine, which is added to, um, in, in several cases, is added to, to not only whiten the flour, but also um, give it kind of a tackiness. Um, so, for instance, have you ever had like a, um, an ice cream sandwich, like the wafer that, that would be on an ice cream sandwich, it, it has that tackier feel to it. Um, that's chlorinated flour. Okay. Is that Here's a part of that question. Okay. Now, question, question for Michael is one, if you would share the recipe, and then this might be for both of you. Uh, how do we find suppliers of local flour? Um, you might be able to offer something from Commun uh, Common Grain Alliance, Michael. Yeah, as far as uh, suppliers, Go. We have two pages on our website that um, should be helpful. The website, again, is commongrainalliance.org. And then at the top, we have a page that says how to buy. And that has our, our members listed by products, um, whether it's a bakery, brewery, or a mill. So there's some resources on there. And then if you go to the our members page, there's an interactive map um, that shows you. It includes all of our members. so um you should be able to find something close to you on there and then um janelle or lena i'm not sure if you all have an idea of how to share the recipe um with everybody yeah um, so the recipe is actually on that first link that you see on the slide now um you can find all the recipes that were shared in this series on that website great and i will send out the links in an email afterwards they're delicious scones. <laughs> Everything they make Ryan. is delicious. <laughs> Ryan, did you, uh, is there, with the growers or farmers that you work with, is there opportunity for maintaining identity or a brand, that maintaining a brand identity for any of the growers? Yes, yes. So we are doing a lot of work right now um, with growing soft wheats as well as hard wheats even in the in the area here. Um, so um, we're, we're more than willing um, to, to purchase grains in small kind of like test varieties. So as people are um, um, developing new types of particular resistances and, and wheats that may grow, um, well, in environments here in the in the Northeast and and well, in Virginia and into the Northeast, um, we do work with a lot of farmers right now. We do have a pretty substantial program where we're, you know, milling these test batches. So we might just get like a truckload of grain. Um, they, you know, they all have their own special names um, that these farmers have given them and milling those and kind of giving back data on, on what, how they milled, what the extraction rates are and, and how well they're yielding on our mill uh, to, to kind of push, you know, give guidance to farmers on what are gonna be the most lucrative crops to grow in this area. Yeah, we definitely, we've been doing a lot of that in the, in the recent years here. Okay, and so within that, there's the opportunity for, for the flour or the grain not to be commingled. Is that what I understand as well? Yes. Yep, yep, absolutely. We have a, you know, so obviously you saw the pictures of the, the facility. Uh, so a lot of different, a lot of ability to segregate here at this facility. Um, the seven tanks that were just built, um, you know, about five years ago, uh, they're, they're pretty large. There's 315,000 bushel um, silos out there, uh, but in our, our elevator A, our original elevator that was, that was here at the start of this mill, which was 50 years ago, built 50 years ago, uh, there is a lot of interstices and a lot of ability to, to segregate grains and to keep specific uh, origins segregated so that we can really see how they perform on a mill. Okay, and then there's another question. It's uh, more 
finding a grower for uh, for small farm needs like rye or barley that I think, uh, Michael, you might be able to speak to it. I think there's also interest in other grains like spelt and triticale and, and uh, you know, just more, art I would say, more artisanal grains. Can you speak to that, either one of you? Sure. Um, I know some of our uh, members are growing different heirloom varieties or ancient grains. Um, like the ones that you mentioned, I, I know that spelt is fairly available in our network. Um, and then I don't know as much as far as animal feed. Um, our, our group is primarily focused on grains for human consumption, but some of our members do grow a little bit of barley and um, other things for in corn for animal feed. I know there's a couple good feed mills in Virginia like Sunrise Farms and um, one in Waynesboro, New Country Organics. Um, that I know they're sourcing some grains regionally or locally for their feeds. Thank you, Michael. Would there be other questions from participants? Um, um, there, Ryan, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Ryan, I'm just curious, uh, like for smaller growers or growers that are just getting into growing grain or wheat, yep. uh, how, how do you work with them or suggestions for them? Yeah, so I guess before uh, we have a, a wheat grower or a wheat uh, buyer, that was out that has been out here in the fall these last several years uh, so with COVID-19 weren't able to do it th this year but uh, we generally every year try to try to get as much um, contact with farmers as we possibly can and have them to the facility um, so we've had a, an event here that where we've had uh, 50 plus farmers you know kind of teaching them about what it is we look for in a crop that we're looking to purchase. Um, but a lot of that comes out of, out of our Denver office, a lot of that communication um, until they're actually here on site and we can you know, interface with, with those guys. Um, I probably could, you know, if there's anybody that's specifically interested in that, um, I could certainly find you know, a, a way that, that they could get in touch with us uh, for more information on that and and any help that we could give to to kind of just spell it out very clearly what what opportunities might exist uh, growing wheat in in this area, um, we'd be more than happy to to help with that. But I'll, I'll probably have to to get a number out to you and and uh, we can go from there. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Ryan and Michael, for sharing your. Uh, both the videos as well as your expertise and insights. Also want to thank all of the participants and for the questions and again the the links to where the webinar notes and resources will be shared as well as the videos. You can see those on the uh, screen and we will be uh, sharing a, a short survey in the near future just so we can get a better sense of uh, how the webinar was received and how we can continue to improve our programming to meet your needs. So uh, please, uh, again, let's thank Ryan, Michael for sharing their time and their expertise. And I would hope that you would have a really good afternoon and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, sure, thanks for having us, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. It's been a privilege to be a part of this. Thanks for putting it together. Thanks, everyone.